8.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Um, we do have quorum here. Um, are we gonna, I don't see the minutes on the agenda, but. Once we do it, okay. Um, I'll be just say one quick thing. I, I did send a letter that the board charged me to send to council. Um, it seemed like they had already had plans to defer the bill, so I was thankful for that. We were able to um, get what we wanted there. Um, but if I know we were sent some other material, uh, so I'll save that discussion for after we hear from our guests today. So we can get started. All right, thank you. Um, so at the last board meeting, uh, board members requested that we put together a panel of some experts. So we have three guests with us tonight at the board meeting, uh, one virtual as well as two in person. So I'd ask guests to come on up. Um, I requested that each person uh, come up with a 10 to 15 minute uh, presentation, more or less, um, with it, and then answer questions from the board. And we'll also have a, a opportunity for community members to ask some questions at the end of the discussion. So um, I'm gonna, start off uh, asking uh, Dave to introduce yourself and each panelist will introduce themselves as we go. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Sure, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. And also as a Perfect. note to the board, um, when you're talking to your microphones, it will be audible through the WebEx. Okay. Let me just sort of switch real quick to my presentation and I will introduce myself and also what we're talking about here. All right, so I hope all you can see my, my, my screen. Uh, my name is Dave Moss. I am Director of Investigations at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, was formed in 1990. Uh, we're an international nonprofit based in San Francisco, and our mission is to protect people's civil liberties, civil rights, and human rights as society adopts uh, more and more advanced technology. And that includes privacy, free expression, innovation, access to information. And we do that through lawsuits and litigation, through advocacy, through policy analysis, and we also build our own privacy-enhancing technologies. Um, my specialty is in police surveillance technology. Uh, I have been researching license plate readers for nearly nine years now. Uh, I have filed more than a thousand public records requests related to license plate readers. So I feel pretty, pretty, pretty confident in talking to you today about what they are, what the problems are with them, and what kind of questions any municipality should be asking before adopting automated license plate readers. And if there's problems with my slides, uh, I can't see you at the moment. So if somebody could shout out to me, I'd sure appreciate it. Okay. So license plate readers. License plate readers are a form of mass surveillance. And what I mean by this is that ALPRs collect and store data on everyone, every driver, regardless of whether there's any suspicion you're connected to a crime. It treats everyone as a suspect who might one day commit a crime. And that is something that law enforcement is explicit about uh, when they are talking to each other or talking to vendors and are maybe less explicit about when they're talking to the public. So I want to talk about, I, I think you know how license plate readers work, the fact that they're a camera that takes photos of license plates, but let me tell you a little bit about what we've seen in terms of how law enforcement uses the technology. So one thing a uh, police department might do is create a hot list, which is essentially a watch list of license plates. And they will get a real time alert on any time a license plate on that list is seen by a camera. So if they're trying to find you or they're trying to stalk you or they're trying to surveil you, 
They can add your license plate and get like a text notification, a push notification, an email alert every time your car is seen by a camera. They can also look at historical travel patterns. They can take your license plate, put it into a database and see where your vehicle has been caught on camera going back years sometimes. They can search by location. They can put in a particular address and see what vehicles were seen near that address. You know, it could be, uh, you know, a place where drugs have been sold, or it could be a mosque, you know, it could be anything. Um, you know, the system, again, is indiscriminate about where it collects data. Uh, they can also map out your social network. They can put in your license plate and ask the system to tell them what other cars were regularly seen near your car. And that could reveal who your associates are, or who your family members are. It can also make predictions. Police can say, hey, I want to find this person at one o'clock tomorrow. Where are they likely to be at one o'clock tomorrow? And the system, if it has enough data, will we'll come up with a recommendation that you are likely seen at, you know, parked at this location or driving to this location at that particular hour. So I want to break down the factors that are going to impact the scale of surveillance with license plate readers. When a police department adopts license plate readers, there's going to be a whole bunch of decisions they need to make, and each one of them is going to affect how much surveillance is occurring. So first of all, the type of license plate reader. We have three general flavors, fixed, mobile, and trailer. However, a, license, a police department might use what is called the hybrid approach and using various kinds of license plate readers. So fixed license plate reader, these are ones that are going to be installed on street signs, on, on stoplights, uh, telephone poles. They are in a fixed location or a stationary location, and they're going to capture all of the vehicles that pass by. If you were to put one of these every block for 10 miles, you would be able to track a car in real time. Then you also have patrol-mounted ALPR. These are sometimes called mobile ALPR. Uh, this allows a police officer to get real-time alerts as they're driving around. They can also go up and down uh, every block of a neighborhood in a process called gridding. Uh, and gridding, I want to show you a slide from the Chandler Police Department in Arizona. Like They actually instruct police officers who have these on their cars to go up and down every single block anytime you have downtime. And the reason, and I want you to just pay attention to these words here, the reason is to help us gather intel to solve future cases. Not things that have already happened, not things that are in process, but hypothetical cases that might happen uh, down the road. ALPR trailers, exactly what they sound like. They're like stationary. They function like a stationary camera in that they sit in one place, but you can move that trailer other places. Um, some police departments purchase these kind of sneaky license plate readers that look like, you know, a speed limit warning, but ultimately they're actually there not to warn people about the speed limit, but to capture people's data as they're driving by. So I want to go over two points two and three, the fact, the second and third factors together. The second factor is once you've decided what kind of license plate readers you're going to use is the number of them. A large number of fixed ALPRs might be able to track a vehicle in real time. It's also going to depend on where the license plate readers are placed, what neighborhoods, what intersections, or what units within a, you know, what patrol units are having them installed. And I would emphasize that even a small number of license plate readers, if you place them strategically, can collect a massive amount of data. Uh, to give you an example, in Atlanta, Georgia, so back in 2018, some reporters got access to raw license plate reader data. And so just as an example, here's one car uh, in a single day in 2018 caught on camera 15 times. Now, this was two or three years ago, and Atlanta has added far more cameras since then. And so I would expect this number to be you know, at least twice that uh, if we were to do the same research today. Um, in Tiburon, California, which is a small hamlet town just north of San Francisco, um, they only have six cameras, but strategically they place them at the entrance and exit to town, allowing them to capture 7.7 .7 million scans a year. Now, if you do the math on that, based on how many roads there are in Tiburon, that means for every 1.85 miles you drive in the city, you are caught on camera once. Uh, that is a particularly high rate. That's the highest rate that we documented in California. And back in 2014, I know this is many years ago, but we got access to raw license plate reader data from Oakland. And we found that just two to three ALPR equipped vehicles, patrol cars, were able to go up and down every block and get 63,000 scans in just a week. 
So the fourth factor is the retention period, how long they're holding on to data. The longer the retention period, the more data is in their server system at any given time. And the longer the data is stored, the more detailed is the picture of the person's life, of your life, of your friend's life who's a driver. And the more data there is, the greater the risk is if there's a data breach or police go in and misuse the system. Uh, point number five, is how the data is shared or exposed. If there is just one person in a police department who's able to access license plate reader data, it's gonna be less exposed than if every police officer can access the data. If only you know, the National Police Department is able to access the data, uh, it'll be better than if they were sharing that nationwide. Now, what we're often seeing around the country is police departments will have their data and they will share it with hundreds of other law enforcement agencies across the country, basically creating this huge vector for abuse. And number six is there's also ways for law enforcement to get data that they didn't collect. They can either get it from other agencies or they can access commercial data sets. So there's one particular company called the Digital Recognition Network that claims it has had it has itself collected 20 billion license plate scans using repo companies who drive around collecting license plate reader data and they will sell Hey, Dave, so we're having some technical difficulties, so pause for a second. We actually can't hear you uh, either, so give us a second to see what's going on.
I mean, he's still streaming online. Dave, can you hear us? Dave, can you hear us? Okay, one second, we can't hear you. No, it's not on you, Dave. It's something on us. Dave, can you say something? Okay, I still can't hear you. One second. Should we consider going with another panelist and, and letting Mr. Moss rejoin later? Do we want to head back to him when he's connected and interrupt them? That's Whatever my concern. Whatever chair's pleasure on that. Let's go ahead and, well... Is there another agenda item that we could go to? Okay. All right. I guess we can move on to the next speaker, which I have on my list is Mr. Siegenthaler from the ACLU. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Siegenthaler, um, he, him pronouns. I'm a policy strategist at the American Civil Liberties Union of Tennessee. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me to talk and for hosting this panel. Um, the ACLU is a statewide nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting uh, freedom, fairness, justice, and equality um, through policy advocacy or public education or legal work. Um, 
Our organization has two primary concerns regarding license plate readers. Um, first, a network of LPRs can threaten the privacy and freedoms of those who pass under the eye of these cameras. Second, LPRs may exacerbate existing over-policing and increase the number of unnecessary interactions between law enforcement and community members, and especially in communities of color and low-income communities. Uh, we've always held that LPRs may have legitimate governmental uses, uh, for example, to act on an AMBER alert. But if LPRs are deployed, they must be strictly, strictly regulated to prevent abuse of this technology. LPRs, as Mr. Moss was saying, have the capacity to read thousands and thousands of plates per minute. Uh, this might be useful data when trying to catch a suspected car thief might, but collected data is rarely relevant to criminal investigations. Uh, in Maryland, for example, the ACLU found only 47 of every 1 million plates read, 0.005% were linked to a stolen car or serious crime. Still, law enforcement agencies, many of them often hold on to the other 999,000 some odd records. We're always concerned about the potential chilling effects of surveillance. So dragnet surveillance threatens to chill the use of certain constitutional freedoms. Uh, when it comes to LPRs, even the International Association of Chiefs of Police have recognized this danger. Report from the organization reads, quote, the risk is that individuals will become more cautious in the exercise of their protected rights of expression, protest, association, and political participation because they consider themselves under constant surveillance. LPRs have been deployed uh, disproportionately, and I, I think Mr. Moss was talking about Oakland, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I'm, I'm, you know, he may talk about this, but the, you're more likely to see an LPR stationed um, in, in a, a black neighborhood than a white neighborhood uh, based on a study that EFF did. Um, an ACLU investigation also found U.S. immigration and customs enforcement used mass license plate reader surveillance to target immigrants. Uh, a private vendor of LPRs, uh, Vigilant Solutions, had an information sharing agreement with ICE and fed ICE LPR data collected by law enforcement agencies across the country. Uh, I, meant a vigilant, I mentioned Vigilant uh, because uh, you all sent a letter requesting information from MNPD on LPR, the, the camera that Metro Police acquired to test out the technology was a Vigilant Solutions camera. Two primary ways to limit LPR abuse are to limit use, use cases and, and data retention. Uh, if uses for LPR are restricted, police cannot retain LPR data indiscriminately or act on LPR hits for routine traffic stops. If the data police do collect can only be kept for a short time and cannot be shared with others, then government can't pool together quite as much information on residents. These help mitigate the excesses of license plate reader tech. As you all know, there are two pieces of legislation before the council seeking to regulate LPR usage, 2021-841, Councilman, uh, Councilmember Rosenberg's bill, and 2021-961, Councilmember Johnston's bill. Uh, the only among these options that we've supported and the bill we think is a vastly stronger and more effective regulation of license plate reader is, at least in its current form, 2021-841. Uh, this bill would regulate LPR uses more strictly. It would uh, allow LPRs to be used to recover stolen vehicles or act on felony arrest or search warrants, uh, but the alternative bill would allow LPR usage in the investigation of a broader set of offenses, uh, not only felonies, but traffic offenses or offenses, quote, associated with violent crimes, a phrase which could incorporate a broad range of content, uh, conduct. Councilmember Rosenberg's bill has a stricter data retention policy that data, which is not the subject of you know, potential enforcement action, must be deleted uh, within 24 hours. I know in the, in the substitute bill, it's 72 hours. Uh, but as it stands now, the, the retention period is 24. 
and it provides stronger oversight mechanisms, including by providing members of this board full access to examine or audit uh, LPR systems rather than just the audit trail, which is what's provided for in 961. Throughout this process, um, advocates for a more expansive rollout of LPRs suggest this could be of great help toward fighting violent crime in Nashville. But the truth is the evidence for whether LPRs are effective in this respect is murky at best. There are not conclusive studies which show LPRs, more LPRs lead to some drop in violent crime. Uh, we do have evidence though that without strict regulation, the threat this technology poses to civil liberties is real. Um, so thanks again for uh, having me and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Siegenthaler. I'm gonna check, do we have Mr. Moss up? Dave, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. We Great. can hear you as well, you can continue. Perfect, let me just bring this up again. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a, a moment here trying to get the uh, screen to share properly. I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Sorry, just bear with me just a moment. All right, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Um, okay, so I was about to talk about some of the common problems that we uh, encounter with license plate readers. So first off the bat, too much data, that the amount of data stored and collected is not proportionate in the least to the public interest. Uh, law enforcement has this inclination to collect it all, but even if most of the data is never going to be relevant. Uh, we also see that license plate readers make mistakes. Uh, they misread license plates. The hot lists in there have never been updated or the technology just, you know, uh, is, is, is misread by law enforcement because it's not communicating clearly. I'll give you some examples here. So in Colorado, uh, there was a, a car full of children who were detained by police and put into handcuffs because a license plate reader mistook a Colorado license plate for a Montana stolen motorcycle. Um, in the Bay Area, we had a privacy advocate, actually somebody who sits on an oversight board in Oakland, who was driving a rental car. And that rental car had uh, been reported stolen at some point, but never been removed from the stolen car database. And so he was pulled over, had you know, held at gunpoint by cops, who thought he had stolen this vehicle that he had just legitimately rented. Um, there's a pretty prominent case in San Francisco where a license plate reader misread a license plate and it resulted in an innocent, innocent woman being uh, pulled into a very traumatic uh, confrontation with police. She ended up suing and it went to the Ninth Circuit and the city of San Francisco was on the hook for almost a half a million dollars for the incident. Some other common problems. Um, 
license plate readers could skew police priorities. Uh, you know, once police have a technology like license plate readers, which are good for certain crimes, but not good for other crimes, police may gravitate towards solving, you know, say car theft more than some of the other community concerns that are more pressing. Uh, depending on where the technology is placed or where police are patrolling, it can result in disproportionate or unequal policing or levels of service. For example, if a whole bunch of license plate readers go up in a business district, police might be responding to shoplifting cases or things like that more often than, say, domestic violence cases elsewhere. Alternatively, or in another situation, say a lot of cameras are put up in a poorer neighborhood, maybe that's going to result in police responding to the poorer neighborhood more often than other neighborhoods, and then that creating a, a cycle where police are collecting more data, then go, using that data to go back, and then collecting more data, and it can have that kind of impact on a community. We also see that the data can disproportionately target communities of color, as well as individuals with limited economic means. And let me show you what I mean by that. So we got that one week's worth of Oakland data, and we mapped it with US Census data. And it became clear almost instantly that AOPR data was disproportionately captured from black neighborhoods in Oakland. Uh, on a similar level, um, uh, we found that uh, or oh, sorry, the ACLU, as well as uh, we did our original research on this as well. But you know, combined between our, our both our organizations, we found that agencies all over, particularly in California, uh, were sharing a license plate reader data with ICE, which was then used for uh, deportation efforts under the Trump administration. Some other common problems: uh, misuse. Uh, you have this big database, and if it's not watched carefully, um, rogue cops might use it for their own personal means. Maybe that's stalking an ex-wife, maybe that's looking up information on their dates, maybe that's trying to find out information on the neighbor they have a dispute with, or maybe it's using that to target somebody who criticized the police at a city council meeting. Um, it can also be used to violate people's First Amendment rights, of free expression, freedom of the press, the right to organize, but I specifically want to, to highlight the freedom to worship. Because one of the most infamous cases, uh, which won these reporters a Pulitzer Prize, uh, involved the NYPD driving around mosques with license plate readers to identify people um, you know, who were Muslims. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a slide here that apparently didn't load. Maybe I can just hit show anyways. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so another case that came up last year is that in California, police were uh, using license plate readers to gather information on people who had attended Black Lives Matter protests. And then days later, they would add them to a watch list and those people would get stopped by maybe cops in a different department and then their cars would be confiscated. Some other problems. Um, you know, this is an industry and it can be profit motivated. We often see that uh, you have policing and policing technology decisions that are driven by relationships between salespeople and cops rather than cops and the community. I have this little image here on the side of one particular license plate reader company called Vigilant Solutions and how at police conferences they have these happy hours where they offer cold margaritas and delicious quesadillas or ice cold beer and popcorn to get that kind of influence relationship going. And I'm pretty sure that most people in the city of Nashville are not able to give the police chief uh, a margarita and a quesadilla before making a decision on a policing technology, but this company you know, actually does. Um, secrecy, uh, often this information about its use is left out of police reports or even court documents. Uh, and sometimes police can't even tell city council members about the technology. So that same company, Vigilant Solutions, as part of its standard agreement with law enforcement, has these two clauses. One is a non-publication clause, and one is a non-disparagement clause. Now, the non-publication clause said that, they, that the police department can't publish anything whatsoever about the AOPR technology without the written consent of the company. Then the second thing it says is that the, the agency can't say anything disparaging about the product without the company signing off. That means if you're you know, a city council member or you're a oversight board and you are expecting a candid response from a police department, they may be contractually obligated not to give you that candid response. Another issue is cybersecurity. These systems are infamously vulnerable to breaches. It, you know, infamously, uh, many cases where technology has been exposed online. 
So in 2015, uh, our organization found that um, more than 100 license plate reader cameras were just left online. Like there was a, a web page that you could go to without any password or anything, and you could access the camera, you could access the live feed of license plate readers, you could get the photos. This is exactly what it looked like. And most of these were in the New Orleans area. Uh, even the federal government is not immune from this. One of its major contractors, a company called Perceptics, that works with Customs and Border Protection, they were breached and, and traveler data was just posted online. I would also point out that, that when you're talking about accepting ALPR, you might be letting other technologies in. So the companies that sell license plate readers aren't just selling license plate readers. They are selling face recognition. They are selling gunshot detection. They are selling predictive policing and body-worn cameras. And sometimes when the police are purchasing something, they're actually getting more than what they're telling the public. So on the right here is a product from Vigilant Solutions, which makes ALPR called Face Search. And oftentimes you'll see uh, city council minutes or city council agenda items where the title is license plate readers. And the contract is about approving license plate readers. But once you get to page 15 or 16, you see that in the scope of work, they've also thrown in face search. Like when you sign up from Amazon Prime for shipping and they give you, you know, Amazon Prime videos, which you didn't ask for, but you suddenly have it. That is often what happens with face search. The face recognition just gets bundled in uh, without the city council or the public knowing. Uh, there's another company called Flock Safety that makes license plate readers. And when they're selling you a license plate reader now, what their plans are, are just to upgrade the software so it can do gunshot detection. And even wilder, they're now claiming that their technology can listen for screeching cars to identify street racing, breaking glass to identify car thefts, sawing metal to identify Cadillac converter thefts. But we often see that these algorithms that claim to identify things are wrong. They have and when they are wrong, they can pull somebody into a tense situation with police that is potentially life-threatening. One thing I really want to emphasize is that surveillance companies are tech companies. You should be skeptical of what they are saying about their tech because there is no incentive for them to share the downsides of their products. They are telling police about all of the miracles about their technology, but none of the risks. We're seeing this play out with Facebook right now. Facebook loves to tell you about how great their product is for society, but lo and behold, you have a whistleblower who has all these internal reports that never saw the light of day about how damaging it was to society. And it's important to know that no matter what their mottos are on their website, no matter what their materials say, public safety is not their primary interest. It is profits because they are a company. And unfortunately, profit is directly in conflict with privacy interests. For a company, they want you to be able to collect as much data as possible because then you are going to buy storage off of them. Uh, you are going to get you hooked on data so you buy more cameras. The more money they make, they're making that money off of your privacy. So I wanna go over finally, I'm just gonna wrap this up real quickly. Here are the questions that I feel like you should be asking. Uh, and if the police department can't answer all of these questions, then they really need to go back and think about this a little bit deeper. So the question you should be asking is like, what data is collecting? Is it just the license plate? Is it a photo of the license plate? Obviously it's gonna have location time, but is it also capturing the make and model, the face of the driver? Is it gonna get the bumper sticker? Is it gonna identify that the car has vehicle damage? Um, two, how and where is the data being collected? Where are these cameras gonna be placed? What patrols are they gonna be assigned to? And tell me, what is the rationale? Why, did, why were these decisions made? Three. How long is the data store? When is it deleted? And what is the justification for this retention period? How does the retention period actually line up to the goals of the program? Four, what are the analytical capabilities of the software? Once you get the data, what kind of algorithms are gonna be applied to it? And similarly, once you have the data, is it gonna be combined with eight other data sources? Are you gonna combine it with the game database? Are you gonna put it into the predictive policing algorithm? How else might it be used? And number six, who is the data shared with? Just internally, or will other police departments be able to access it? Is ICE gonna be able to get it? Is the FBI gonna be able to get it? These are questions that need to be answered. Seven, what are the defined purposes for which the system may be accessed or searched? Is it for every possible crime on the books, or is it only for violent crime? Is it only for vehicle crime? Being very specific about what is appropriate for this technology. 
Uh, number eight, who can access the system and how? Just certain police officers, all police officers, and what kind of training are they gonna receive? And is that training coming from a policing expert? Is it coming from someone from the civil rights community? Or is it coming from the vendor who's going to teach the police officer to use it in the way that's most profitable for the company? Uh, what are the transparency mechanisms? What information will be shared with the public? And what will be subject to public records laws? Can I put in a public records request to get your license plate reader data? That's definitely a question that needs to be answered. Then I would ask the police, like, how do they how do they plan to measure the technology's effectiveness or ineffectiveness? Is it is a year from now, are they going to come back and just give me a bunch of anecdotes? Or are they going to come back with actual data because they collected it meticulously to make sure that they were able to know, did this work or not? Uh, how is the system audited for misuse? How are they checking the logs to make sure that police aren't abusing the system? And will those... Uh, result of the audit be available to the public? And will the oversight be, body be able to look at the logs? Number 12, what are the impacts on vulnerable communities? How is this going to affect a black community? How is this going to affect the, the LGBTQ community? How are immigrants going to be affected by it? Because it is going to have an impact on them. And so you also want to know, how are they going to mitigate those potential harms? And then finally, you're going to want to ask, has this technology or this company uh, ever experienced a data breach or some other kind of unauthorized access? What problems has it already faced? And that's all I got for you today. So I'm here to answer whatever questions you want, and I hope that was informative and, and helps you as you, you work through this process. Thank you, Mr. Mass. Does anyone have any questions at the moment? We got, we got um, these now. Mr. Kemal Gooch. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dave. A uh, quick question. I know you kind of went over... Um, the relationships between license plate readers and, and all of these things, especially data. But is there any relationship between license plate readers and gentrification or displacement in that manner? So that, that's an interesting question because I would say I would say I'm certainly if you if you look at it close enough and depending on the community, then yeah, I think you might you might see that connection. I remember hearing from. Uh, uh, one of the, the CEOs of a, a license plate reader company and the reporters were asking him, you know, you know, what is the impact of this technology going to be? What is, what is the, what is, what is the community going to get out of this technology? And one of the things he said was, oh, you're going to see a rise in the property values. Uh, like housing prices are going to go up. And I'm like, I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a societal benefit. Um, but I, I would say that, that one of the things you also see is that this becomes like an electronic gated community. If you put uh, a license plate reader at the entrance and exit of your neighborhood, you're going to be able to see who's coming in and who's not, you know, who's coming in and when they're leaving. And so, you know, especially when we see homeowners associations using this, and I guess in a way a homeowners association is reflective of gentrification. But if you have a homeowners association or another community group that has set that at the entrance and exit, they're going to start like using that to determine who should be and shouldn't be in that community. And especially if the technology is able to do things like um, identify when a car has um, like, uh, 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 you know, scratches or dents or has a poor paint job, or maybe it has like a busted fender, um, you know, that could, could raise some, some economic disparity issues where a, a neighborhood is, you know, some, neighborhood guard or neighborhood official is like, hey, there keeps coming in these cars. And every time somebody comes in with a car that's beat up, uh, I'm going to go follow them around and make sure they're not up to any good. And that, you know, like can trickle across various, uh, various different demographics. Um, thank you for that. And my next question is aimed at one of the things that you talked about, the um, effects that it could have on marginalized community like black folks, LGBTQIA folks. Um, I feel like at one point I read about the difficulty that this software has on identifying black people. And that is because the software was developed through identifying non-black folks. Can you just kind of talk about that piece of this software around the misreads and things like that? So, so I, you're talking about face recognition and how one of the problems with face recognition, like there's this, with face recognition, there's this like, this like double bias problem when it comes to, to black members of our community. On one hand, the technology is just not as good at, at well, let's say it's, it's, 
it's it makes more mistakes with black faces than white faces. And that comes down to the training data sets that they used and the fact that it was built by a, a disproportionately white developers and using, you know, a disproportionate number of white faces. So that's the one thing you're talking about. But the other element is that if you have a face recognition system and you have connected your face recognition system to your mugshot database and you have a police department that going back decades has been over-policing the black community, you're gonna have a disproportionate number of black faces in your database. And as a result, like you're gonna, you know, face recognition is going to quote, work better with one community than it would with another community, simply because your over-policing is resulting in more over-policing. It's just like technologically enhanced over-policing. Um, when it comes to license plate readers, um, I mean, it's, you know, license plate reader, you know, license plate is a license plate, it's letters and numbers. And so it's pretty simple, basic technology. However, if you have a, a situation where police are over-policing your community, and one of the things they do in the process of over-policing is capture people's license plates and then add them to a watch list, you're gonna end up with that same like recurring problem where you've just taken your over-policing issue and then exacerbated it by levering, like layering technology over it. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you for that. Mr. Holloway and then Mr. Brown. Uh, looking at um, what you had just described to us and then it brings back um, a situation where um, we had an officer and shared a video of a DUI arrest uh, with his family, Steve McNair. And he was not terminated, but he was moved from that particular section. So uh, one of the major thing is what are the consequences if you use it on a personal uh, use? Uh, say you're going through a bad divorce and uh, you're trying to get evidence that could strengthen your case on your child support or um, uh, your case, period, you know. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And uh, so that is a major concern that was brought to my attention this week. And so it was um, the consequence and basis of what would happen if, if, if you're caught doing that. And it shouldn't be just a slap on a wrist. If you got the near enough to do that, use that against people, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be uh, employed. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Judge Brown. Well, you, you've given us a long list of horribles about license plate readers. One is, do you have anything favorable to say about them? And second, you've given us a lot of things that really don't seem to apply to what we have before us with these uh, council bills. Have you read the proposals that are before the council and have any suggestions as to uh, improvement of them or particular criticism? I mean, uh, you're talking about retaining stuff for years, but these bills have uh, pretty strict retention rates. So I'm curious, uh, do you have comments about these specific uh, uh, motions that are before the council? Because uh, you've given us just California problems and everything else, and I hadn't heard one uh, favorable thing said about them. And license plate readers have had uh, some significant uh, improvements. Uh, we recently had an amber alert where license plate reader picked up the car on its way to California uh, in another state and helped them track it down. So obviously there's some benefit from this. Uh, there are some risks, but all I've heard from you, frankly, is just negative. Sure. So I would say that, that um, so I don't have any comments today for the, um, for uh, on the proposal before you. And that's simply because, uh, you know, when this came to me, I was asked to be, to do a um, informative talk and that in order to give you uh, a, a thorough criticism of or uh, analysis of the proposal before you, that would take us several weeks on our end and in a much larger team. Uh, and, and so I probably, we could do that for you, but it would take some time. Um, 
On the issue of the positive aspect, I mean, my job is to protect people's civil liberties and privacy. There's a whole industry of companies out there that are going to be telling you all the miracles of this technology. Police are going to be telling you about all the miracle of their technologies because it's not exactly the police's job. Like, I wish it was the police's job or like police saw it as their job to protect people's civil rights. We're just not seeing that in their country. And so my role is not to sit here and, and, and like find these good examples of, of, of where it went right. You, I think you can find another uh, visitor or presenter to present you that. But I would say that one of the reasons I no longer have anything good to say about ALPR is that after eight years of doing this, I have just seen the companies and police departments working so irresponsibly about it everywhere. And even when you bring it up to them, they're like, hey, the law says this, but you're doing this. They don't ignore it. You get the auditor to come in, the state auditor to come in, they look at it, they still ignore it. I have sat across from police chiefs, not police chiefs, but high-ranking police officers and seen them literally lie to legislators. And I'm just like, I'm just a researcher here. I'm not a government official. I am a little bit of a loss about how to hold these people accountable, other than to tell you what I see happening. Um, but I would encourage you to, to maybe speak to some, some police officers, maybe find some, some, you know, I think there are, you know, you're certainly going to find cases where it worked with an Amber Alert. But I would point out that when somebody, there is an Amber Alert and somebody crosses through a watch list, that piece of data happens instantly. That's not something that happened a year ago or a day ago or six weeks ago. That is something that happened instantly. So everybody else who passed through that camera, there's no reason to keep them in the database. You can just keep the Amber Alert and nobody else. I just wish no, somebody was doing a system like that, but it doesn't seem like anyone is. Thank you, uh, Director Fitchard, and then Mr. Wynn. So I ha my question is related. It's a little bit about what Mr. Holloway said a moment ago. So I know that you're in San Francisco, um, and I know that you are um, a researcher. Do you know if um, there's been any um, info on how the San Francisco Police Department has disciplined officers who have misused this technology? And if you have any information regarding the oversight of this technology in San Francisco or in the Bay Area period, can you share that with us as well? So just as, as a matter of correction, I'm actually in Reno, Nevada. Um, uh, although we're organized in San Francisco and I've lived in California for a while, I'm, you know, I'm a Nevada. So, <laughs> um, but um, so there has been, you know, there's not a lot of transparency about misuse of license plate readers. Like this has been a borough problem in California. The law says in California that you have to conduct audits uh, to prevent misuse and you have to take steps to protect people's civil liberties and privacy. But when we started filing public records requests, and I mean, I'm talking about several dozen agencies we sent public records requests to asking for those audits, they would come back and say, we didn't do those audits. We don't have those audits. And so it's a question of how many abuses went by uncaught because nobody even bothered to look. What I can say is that, you know, on, at the California Department of Justice level, as well as at, at most, you know, you know, um, attorney general levels in most states, you're sometimes able to get data about the abuse of police computer systems more generally. So in California, that's CLETS. In Florida, that's a system called David. Um, in Oregon, I don't remember what it's called in Oregon, but, but you know, just the general cons computer systems that you look up people's criminal records and their driver's licenses. And it just happens frequently. There are like in California, there are dozens and dozens of people who are dismissed from their jobs, uh, uh, suspended, given retraining, and sometimes prosecuted for violating those databases. And sometimes the violation of the database is just like they were on a date with for, they were um, going on a date with somebody on OkCupid and they wanted to look up their criminal record in advance. Sometimes it's a cop accepting a bribe or uh, they have like a relationship with a gang and they're trying to get information on witnesses. So it really runs the gamut when it comes to, you know, these computer systems, which are very well regulated and they still catch people all the time. And then you have license plate readers, which really no one seems to be auditing very closely. Yeah, so I'd like to know the, what your research tells you about agencies that have oversight that monitors the license plate reader program versus agencies that don't have community oversight. And do you recommend 
that if an agency is going to use a license plate reader, that an independent body like a community oversight board monitors and has the capability of auditing the program. So there's there's like a few different models I've seen for uh, a city level oversight. So one is a legislative model called CCOPS, which stands for Community Control Over Police Surveillance. And that generally just says at its basic level that police can't acquire a technology until the city council has approved the policy and the purchase. And so in that case, the city council would be the default oversight board. Uh, we've also seen um, uh, models where a actual privacy oversight board is created, which is the situation in Oakland. There's an ordinance in San Diego that it's also the case. And I believe there's some other city in the country that has a similar um, model. Um, but I have been saying, so I've been attending NACOL, uh, the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, on and off for, for several years. And uh, long before there were these CCOPS laws, I was saying that oversight boards need to be looking at surveillance technology, that um, you know, typically they are dealing with police abuse in a way people know when they've been beaten up by a cop. People know when they've been falsely arrested by a cop. They know when they've had stuff stolen from them from a cop. They know when they've been verbally abused from a cop. What they don't necessarily know is when a cop has accessed their data. And I think that if a police officer is prying in your data, getting personal information, even if you don't know it's happened, it's still a violation. And that the same bodies that are protecting uh, us from police physical abuse should also be looking at police digital abuse. Now, I tend to leave it city to city to decide which model is, is right for you. But if you as a body feel it is your responsibility to hold the police in check, then I don't think that should end with you know what happens uh, at a police stop. It should happen at all stages of policing. And as police becomes more technological, so should your oversight. Mr. Hayes. Since you've had a lot of experience with uh, license plate readers, and I would imagine that because you said the companies, they usually are trying to make a profit. So I would imagine they usually go to cities and they come with what I would say is a teaser and they, they say, oh, these are all the great things we can do and we're gonna give you a trial period and at no cost. But typically, once these things are up and running, what's the typical cost? Uh, if you look at hardware, software, and uh, if, you, if you know even with labor costs, but even, even I would say the software and hardware, typically what does that cost for an average city in, in, in the United States? Oh, I wish I had a, a really good answer for you because it really depends on which company and, um, and the kind of setup you have because there's a difference in cost. So some police departments will be will say, we don't want anything going on a third party cloud. We understand mm -hmm. that this is gonna be law, if not personal private information, it will be law enforcement sensitive information. And we don't want that leaving our internal servers. And it's obviously gonna cost your police department a lot more to set up your own server, to have your own cybersecurity team who's able to protect that server. Um, and you know, just maintain that is all gonna be a lot more expensive. And so a lot of companies come in and say like, oh no, we can store it on the cloud for you and that will bring your cost down because we've got all, all this, the infrastructure. And so that'll bring it down quite a bit. Um, but then it's often really hard to, to understand the cost as well because you know, there are certain companies out there that are, that are upstarts and it's unclear whether what they're charging you is actually like the cost or if they're charging you a discount in order to get a foothold in the market so that later they can sell themselves to a bigger company saying, we have this many clients that we got, you can buy us, and then you'll see those prices go up. Um, we certainly saw um, uh, several years back, Vigilant Solutions would offer its commercial database for free to law enforcement. They were like, here, you know, you can have this for free. We're not gonna charge you for it. And then once police got in the, you know, used to using it and started relying on upon it, they were like, okay, it's not free anymore. And then they started charging them several thousand dollars a year or a month, depending on what, how much they were using and how many user accounts. Um, but I would say that, 
you know, generally you're looking at like anywhere from a few thousand dollars to a couple tens of thousand dollars per camera. Uh, but that might be a better question for somebody who works in procurement. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Abdullah. Yes, I'm, I'm actually curious as to the accuracy of the actual technology itself. Uh, the only time I've ever experienced any of these cameras, I, I got a ticket personally from a state that I never visited. So I'm curious as to the accuracy of the cameras. I find it really like interesting that you bring that up because, um, I mean, I think I too have gotten one of those tickets from a red light camera and red light cameras, you know, or speeding cameras or things like that. Um, are you know one of the earliest applications of license plate reader technology and you know i think that you know when you look at like the state of texas like the state of texas just outlawed um uh red light cameras and you wouldn't think of texas as a defund the police kind of state you wouldn't think of it as an anti-law enforcement state um you think of it as a law and order state and yet in in texas they realized that people were having so many problems with the error rate um, with these cameras and that these cameras often for many jurisdictions were just a source of income. That if you just adjust the, the, the length of your yellow light by a little bit, you, and, you know, and you, you, know, you know, sometimes with your error rates, if you just ignore the error rate, people sometimes won't even, will just pay the bills rather than go in and deal with it. So I find it interesting that you, you raised that. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on error rate it's the fact of the matter is, is that all of these companies uh, consider their their algorithms proprietary. They don't let me or any you know university researchers sit down with their algorithm and test it out. Um, they just don't. Um, it's it's like we have the same issue with shot spotter and gunshot detection. Um, all you can really do is try to get the data on how many uh, you know with shot spotter you look at how many times police went out to a gunshot and didn't find anything. And then you're like, okay, well, maybe there were some false alarms there. Uh, but I would think that, that you know, as, you know, if I was to advise a, a city council that was looking at license plate readers, I would ask for that. Ask if you can get an independent audit of not just, of, of two particular things. One is the audit of how well it reads license plates and what the accuracy is on the license plates. But the other thing is the accuracy on the GPS. Like how accurate is the location? Because maybe it reads a plate correctly, but maybe it maps that plate to three blocks. And that three blocks can be the difference between somebody being put near a scene of a crime or somebody being at like, you know, the McDonald's minding their own business. Mr. Kamaguchi and then Director Fitchard. Uh, thank you for that. I just I also wanted to mention, I think it was oversight brought up just a few minutes ago. I think my concern is we we barely have cooperation now, so I don't know if we'll actually be able to do oversight of, of an advanced equipment this much. But my question um, is, and I think you mentioned this before, is the data of on the effect that license plate readers have on things like violent crime. I think that's very specific here that, I mean, in Nashville right now, they talk about license plate readers as a solution to drag racing, as a solution to car theft, as a solution to gun violence, as a solution to uh, violence. Even here today, we talked about as a, as a solution to Amber Alerts and things like that. So can you talk on the data set that talks about the effect of license plate readers on things like that? Because we have a menu of things that uh, law enforcement and different agencies are telling us that license plate readers will solve. So from, from what I've, I've gathered, like I don't, I don't think there's any like good data set that shows how it was used and how it wasn't used. And one of the problems is in getting that kind of data is that the companies will explicitly tell law enforcement to leave it out of police reports. They will say, like, if you got alerted on a license plate reader, you know, find some other excuse to pull the person over and then use that as what you say on the on the police report on how you found your suspect. And so there's this actual, um, you know, intentional secrecy that makes it impossible for people to get a fair evaluation of how that works. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, uh, license plate readers, by their very nature, are seem to be pretty good with car theft. 
Um, that's why insurance companies love license plate reader data because it's a car. You know, if somebody drives off with a car, uh, you know, you can track it. Um, and that's all well and good, but I would say that, uh, I mean, I don't know about Nashville, but certainly San Francisco has some very, very smart car thieves. Um, and it does not take uh, an industrious group of car thieves very long to figure out a way around a license plate reader. Um, I, I think if you sat and thought about it for a few minutes, you could come up with it. I'm not gonna give tips for evading a license plate reader in a public hearing, but it's not, it's not that hard to figure out ways um, if you are industrious, uh, and clever and devious uh, car thief. Um, I would say that there are certain cases with like Amber Alerts and things like that, that they may become useful. However, I would note that for those sorts of things, you do not have to collect data on everyone else. That is not gonna be useful for that. Um, I don't know, when I, when, I, when I see the information out there, um, I see two different flavors of claims about how it's effective. One is just these cherry picked incidents where license plate reader was one element in a series of policing decisions and techniques. And the company is making it sound like the license plate reader was the clutch thing that, that made the investigation come to a head. When really, if you pull out the police report or you pull out the indictment, you're going to be like, no, that's not it. This was just a minor thing that could have been, you know, found out by some other means. Um, the other thing that we see is something a little bit more nefarious where you have a company like, you know, document crime going down and then claim that that's correlated to the use of this technology without taking into account all the other economic factors, all of the policing factors, all the city council decisions that could have gone into a decrease in crime. Uh, in fact, if you listen to like, like uh, you know, these vendors, you would think that, that, that the United States was racked by crime everywhere, that crime is going up everywhere, and that it's just a horrible place to live. When actually, if you look at like the federal crime data or the state level crime data, you know, crime on the whole has been going down over the last few decades. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. I just wish I did have the data to be able to give you a, a comprehensive answer on this. No, I think that answer was pretty comprehensive. Thank you for that. Director Fitchard. Okay, thanks. This question is for the ACLU. Um, are you aware, or can you speak of any lawsuits that have been filed by the ACL, ACLU regarding privacy concerns related to LPRs in this state? In this state, I am not aware of any lawsuits related directly to license plate readers. Uh, there was a lawsuit we filed in Memphis a few years back having to do with police surveillance of activists uh, particularly black activists. Uh, they had violated a consent decree uh, not to kind of blanket surveil um, folks of a certain political persuasion in the 70s. And they were found to have violated that consent degree um, in the last few years. Uh, so that wasn't related directly to license plate reader, but it was related to uh, police abuse of surveillance. Thank you. I'm gonna um, is there any other questions? If I'm going to stop questioning there and go to our next guest because we're running out of time here. Uh, Ms. Tompkins. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Vienna Tompkins. I am a, um, a organizer with the Black National Assembly. I'm also a researcher and data analyst um, focusing on criminal justice. I currently work at the Center for Policing Equity. I'm not here on their behalf, um, but I do work with them and we um, analyze racial bias in policing. Um, I also have a pretty extensive experience with risk assessment algorithms, both um, implementing them as a technical assistance provider as well as validating them uh, and examining them for racial bias. I think that um, the, the debate around risk assessments actually draws a lot of parallels with the debate around LPRs in terms of uh, implementing technology that's often not fully understood, often sort of uh, considered to be uh, proprietary and hidden and is something that can perpetuate a lot of biases that already exist in the system. Um, I don't want to uh, belabor any of the points that have already been made by the other two um, panelists, so I'm going to focus a little bit on the issues um, that I see based on my experience working with governments and implementing technologies, um, as well as the community's concerns um, that I've heard as well. So I think the first big one that's already been discussed is the, the lack of effective oversight um, in 
uh, in these bills that we have, the, the DA and the public defender are um, able to audit, of course, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be audited. There isn't any sort of specificity around the mechanisms for that. Um, and that's a big issue with uh, risk assessments as well. There is not a feedback loop that will uh, sort of monitor and check in if something goes wrong. It's sort of a reactive thing uh, that happens, if it happens at all, as evidenced by um, what's already been discussed, that it, it may not happen. Even if it's in the policy, uh, it may not happen. Um, and obviously, as you all know, on the oversight board, um, you're often limited in what you're able to do. Uh, and so sort of going on uh, the ability that you have to do those audits uh, in writing doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to do those effectively. Uh, and that's a huge concern with this technology. Um, and, uh, you know, that risk is obviously amplified for the communities that are already the most impacted uh, negatively by uh, policing and the criminal justice system in general. So it's really a question of trade-offs, right? So we've talked about sort of these anecdotes of these big cases that are maybe they say are broken by LPRs, um, but are you willing to trade off um, the, the privacy uh, and um, the, some of the civil rights of your communities, particularly those that are most marginalized for you know, the occasional big win that probably could have been solved using other things anyway. Um, also the potential for data to be connected with other system data sets or um, other information and used in ways that it wasn't intended. Again, even if this is written into uh, the regulations of these tools, that doesn't guarantee that it's not going to happen. Implementing these tools opens the door for those things to happen regardless of whether they're supposed to or not. Um, and that's a, a major concern for community members who already don't trust the current system that we have in place and giving them more tools to further surveil is not going to help that perception at all. Um, and generally, um, in my experience working with governments and um, particularly around data, connecting data sets across different agencies um, and trying to uh, maintain uh, confidential, data confidentiality when transferring data. Um, there is uh, not, you know, the, the things that, that um, governments and government agencies are supposed to do around data privacy, around ensuring that data is encrypted, transferring data effectively, those things do not often happen. Um, you know, working as a technical assistance provider um, and requesting data and going through, you know, all of these different data sets, it is very, very frequent that folks do not follow their own data privacy and confidentiality agreements. And so that's a major concern. And also, uh, not to mention the potential for data breaches, especially if you're starting to talk about having things offsite, if that's the cheaper option, you know, that's a huge risk as well. Um, so it's not, it's not really a question of if, uh, when it comes to the potential for these things to be misused, it's a question of when. Um, and it's also uh, much more likely that those things are not able to be prevented. They're caught after the fact. Um, and so, you know, really it's, it's uh, not something that is going to just sort of blanket, obviously blanket solve any of these problems that were listed before. And it's going to open the door for lots of potential misuse um, and lots of potential negative impacts on folks that are already dealing with the negative impacts of the system. Um, so, you know, I think um, a, a, neither bill is really uh, going to do the job in terms of making sure that these things are not misused um, or really regulating them with enough specificity. I think, you know, there's talk about equitable, equitable distribution of these things. There's not really a definition of what that means. What is it equitable in relation to? Is it population? Is it crime rates? How is that going to be determined? I think that's a really big question that needs to be answered. Um, and also, uh, the different uh, pieces around the types of images that are being captured, are occupants and cars being captured? I think there needs to be um, a little more review around uh, how realistic are those expectations that are laid out in those regulations in, in relation to the actual tools that are going to be used. So, um, you know, I think that um, the lessons that I've learned in working around risk assessments, the challenges that have come up, the promises that are made and are not actually kept when those technologies are used in practice, um, and then the accuracy of those tools and the, the lack of uh, technical expertise in the agencies that are implementing them leads to a really, really big potential for these things to be misused and further perpetuate biases that are already existing in the systems. Um, so that's my perspective. Um, thanks so much, and I'm happy to take questions. I have one question. Yeah. What do you think a good audit would look like if, for example, we have the ability to audit? Um, 
Well, I think that depends on how, how the tool is implemented and, and what types of things are being collected. Um, I think, you know, ideally, and I, and I am 99% sure that what I would consider a good audit would not be possible with any of these private companies that are, that are um, offering this up, but I think that you would need to be able to do something like uh, similar to what you would do with a risk assessment validation, figure out how accurate the tools are, and then do different tests against it to see where maybe different biases are um, in the way that the tool is designed. So I think it was mentioned earlier about uh, training data sets. Um, how are those training data sets put together? Um, and thinking too about like distribution of the, of the license plate readers. How is that being done? How is uh, equity being measured? Um, are there any sort of biases being baked into that data set based on the way that they're being implemented? I think would be a, a, a big component in that. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Um, I found very helpful, Mr. Siegenthaler, your framing um, that it's important to limit the use case and also limit retention time if this must happen. Um, so my question, and it may be for any of the panelists, are, are there any real experiences with the proposed time frames of 24 hours and I guess 72 hours, are those real? Are they sufficiently ephemeral to stop some of the cross uses that all three of you have testified to? Um, and can adherence to those erasure times be audited? Thank you. So um, I think if 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 they are adhered to, uh, you know, if that information is actually deleted, and that, that also kind of gets into the definition of what is what does deleted mean? Um, is it is it you know marked for trash, and you can still find it there on you know the server or the you know the cloud or whatever? Um, is it overwritten somehow? Is it destroyed? You know, what are the protocols around deleting that data? I think is sort of the first the first question there. Um, and so, if it is you know deleted within or destroyed within twenty four hours, um, I think that's probably um, enough. Uh, a, a short enough time period that it, it reduces the risk of that information being used in other ways. Um, but you know, to to what you're saying, it's it has to be adhered to <laughs> for that for that to work. Um, I think I don't, I don't I'm not familiar with um, sort of the the metadata that is collected um, with the various different um, options for license plate readers, but you should be able to trace um, you know what happens with with those data files, um, and I I would hope that these systems also trace who is doing those things. Um, so you could potentially, um, assuming that that the they um, the vendors allow for it. You could trace who did what and when, um, and and audit that trail uh, of what was what was destroyed. Thank you. I did have one additional question around that data. Do either of these bills have any protections to prevent the? stealth inclusion of an additional product. Um, the face recognition gets thrown in for free. So if is there any way to monitor or limit that in the procurement? And if it is included, are we able to get at that if the question makes sense? And I'm done, thank you. My understanding is the substitute in one of these bills has a facial recognition ban component, uh, and and uh, may have to be corrected on that if I'm wrong. Um, but the substitute to uh, 841 has an explicit amendment, uh, or uh, the substitute or amendment to the bill that explicitly bans facial recognition, uh, which we hope is something that's included. But that's also the substitute that takes it up from 24 hours to 72 hours, correct? I, I would have to look uh, again to, to see whether it's a substitute right, the amendment contained there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Yoon. I don't re mind responding a little bit to that. I also read that substitute, and there's nothing preventing it from being added on after the fact. So even though it might be initially prohibited, certainly it could be modified to let it come on. It could also be, I think, put in and just not utilized um, until such time as it 
later becomes <laughs> an issue. And I would also say that 24 hours, 72 hours, there's a exclusionary uh, list of exclusions that basically swallow up those rules. So even though it may say 24 hours, even though it may say 72 hours, I think what's also equally as important, if not more so, are the list of exclusions which include criminal investigation, which isn't artfully defined, which isn't, so I, the only analogy I can think of is when detectives place hoads on it, people for interviews, that doesn't go through a magistrate, that doesn't get a warrant of, uh, obtaining of it, and so the rule, these exceptions can easily swallow up these rules. Now past that 24 hour window, now past that 72 hour window, we're looking at the state's 90 day window, and even that has a list of exceptions. So this information can very quickly go from that 24, 72 hour retention into that 90 day retention, and then into that perhaps year long. And one more question. Can you talk more about the importance of the lack of expertise? Is it's not enough to say that the community oversight board will have the power to audit the system, or it's not enough to say council will have the power to audit the system. It's that we should have the right people auditing the system. Your mic is. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that this is a challenge in terms of technology regulation across the board um, when it comes to, to um, folks in government. I think that there is um, a you know a special set of of knowledge and skills that you need to have to really understand the inner workings of things like these. So um, it's not uncommon that um, that no one in inside of an agency really has has the the resources to have that that knowledge and skills. So I think that you definitely will would want to try and find. Um, you know, to, because you don't know what questions to ask if you don't have that that knowledge. Um, and so, in my past experience working on risk assessments, we were brought in as a third party because we had the, those knowledge and skills, and were able to advise and and say these are the types of research questions you need to be asking um, when you're doing your validations or auditing or what have you. Um, so it's I think that's really essential um, to to being able to understand it because if you don't really have that. That understanding, and this is again something that was really big with the risk assessment debate, was people are throwing words around like fairness and bias, and not really defining what those mean in a practical, statistical sense. Um, and it's very easy to kind of um, hear those words um, or hear the success stories and be kind of um, persuaded without knowing what's going on under the hood and, and knowing how to ask the right questions. So I, I think that's really essential to being able to to um, effectively know what questions to ask and, and when to be doing the audits. Thank you. Director Fitchard? Yeah, and I'm going to uh, uh, address uh, for you, um, Vianna. Um, you were just talking about bias. And, and, and so when we read these bills and they talk about the, you know, that this technology is neutral, right, can you speak on that a little bit to give us a better idea what, what, what they're talking about when they talk about it's neutral? Yeah. Absolutely. I think there is a um, sort of general um, assumption that technology um, is unbiased or it's neutral or it, it's it's math, it's numbers, it doesn't have a, an agenda. Um, that's never the case. Um, everything exists in context. And so um, in the context of something like LPRs, um, that's the context of the police department. Um, and we know um, that policing is, is biased. And so um, there is not a way to remove that bias from the equation. Um, and so uh, if you're using words like neutral um, uh, or un unbiased, you know, there are bias and, and fairness are things that you can quantify. Um, you, can, you can define them. You can try to. Not everyone's going to agree on the definition, but you can try, try to do that. Um, but you know, technology is a tool, um, and it is not the right tool to solve every problem. Um, and I think technologists and entrepreneurs really like to come up with solutions, um, and sometimes maybe even create problems that don't, uh, that aren't quite the problems that really exist um, when they're just trying to find something to create a solution for. Um, and so I think that's definitely the case with something like these um, LPRs. Is we have, we do have many problems in Nashville. We have folks who, you know, need housing, need food, need better jobs um, and and that is what is driving crime it's not that we don't have enough cameras watching people all the time and so if you want to actually solve the problem you have to start by understanding what the problem is um, and then develop a solution and acknowledge that technology might not be the right solution to that problem any more questions from the board Yep, 
Mr. Yoon. Sorry, just briefly, the other part to that question I think I heard from uh, Board Member Hildreth was about the ability or access for the public defender, the district attorney, and the, in, in one of the bills, the Community Oversight Board, but not the other, um, to audit and have access to this information. I, I think it's important to distinguish, although access and the uh, perhaps ability was put in there, it wasn't done meaningfully because it also requires resources and time. And it's one thing to say, you can access the 10th floor if you want to, but if there are no stairs to get to the 10th floor, it doesn't really mean much. So I, I do think that's something that the speakers have pointed out as well. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, uh, thank you, panelists. My, my question is really for panelists, it's for board members. I know we just got here with a lot of information. And also, if I know we've been pretty much keeping up with this LPR thing since October of last year. And we're getting. I know myself, I'm getting all different type of information coming from all different sorts. Um, so I'm just curious and I wanted to hold space to see how board members felt um, about what we're hearing today, um, just like what's going through folks' head. Mr. Wynn. Yeah, I had a question uh, uh, from Ms. Tompkins, is it? Um, you mentioned bias, and it's been brought up uh, several times. Um, it's been my view that anti-bias policing is sort of in its infancy. We haven't really institutionalized it in police academies across the country yet. Now you're saying there's a, another level of police bias with technology. Is that is that what you just said? Um, so you're you're asking if. I'm another level. Uh, the use of technology to carry out police bias. Um, sure. So yeah. So te technology will will um, often amplify or or perpetuate the biases of the system that is implemented in, okay. in any system. What's your experience with an enlightened law enforcement agency that talks about anti-bias policing with use of technology? Um, so uh, I, I don't know that, um, you know, we uh, certainly there are, are you know, uh, police departments that are trained on, on bias and, and all that. I think that, um, I think that gets kind of to a deeper philosophical understanding of policing in this country um, and, and what it was created to do. Um, and so I think, sure, you can, you can have a, a police force that's perhaps more aware of, of bias and is working to, um, to remove the bias in whatever ways that they can. Um, but I think that's certainly an uphill battle um, just in the way that, um, that the policing is, is designed. So um, I think that when it comes to the technology piece, um, like we were talking about earlier in terms of having the understanding and the technical knowledge to really know how to, how to implement it and how to evaluate it, um, I think most police departments don't have folks in house who actually have that, that understanding of, of the technology um, to really know how to take those measures. I also think that there's a lack of, to, to um, um, what uh, the panelist from EFF was talking about, a lack of transparency into these things so that folks who have that knowledge, like researchers and universities and um, you know, think tanks and things can really dig in and do that research and really understand what is going on and figure out how to counteract any bias that might, might be happening. Um, and so I think if you don't have that transparency, um, it's really difficult to even understand what bias is happening in the first place. Um, you can see the effects of it um, in you know, the stories that, we, that we've seen here, um, but to understand the mechanisms of how that's happening and why, there needs to be more transparency um, to folks outside of policing as well, I think. So, so, the, so to add to that, then, your transparency for a, a bill to be proposed by the city that excludes oversight in a procedure that's got all kinds of possible abuses to it um, is, a, is a problem. Is that the way yeah. you see it? Yes. So yeah. we don't even know what the problems are yet. I mean, but, when we, a, but, yeah. when, but when a city offers a bill that says, we don't want oversight from the citizens group over what we're doing that can be controversial, shouldn't that raise a red flag that they're actually practicing a bias? Uh, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a red flag that they're they're practicing the bias, but it is a, a red flag in that um, that transparency should be there. Um, there, you know, there should be oversight over over the obviously <laughs> police activities, including the use of surveillance. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the board, Mr. Holloway? Well, they don't. They don't see it as being biased. It's up to us to to clarify it for them. Uh, their thing is um, use it as a system in certain area as a high crime area, you know. But but it's really up to the people to determine how it's been misused, how they've been mistreated. You know, they're not gonna say it's biased, but the bottom result, the bottom line, that's what it is. You call it what it is. If it's a snake, it's a snake. And it's up to us to make that determination what it is and not to let it go through. Uh, and we have to make sure that we let the oversight board be a part of this system if it goes through so we can represent the people. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. There are no other questions from the board. Um, thank you to our panelists for coming and speaking with us today. And we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes. If anyone wants to move to approve the minutes. So moved. A second. Thank you. Uh, any focused discussion on that? Yes. Dr. Heldreth. Thank you. Um, in reviewing the minutes, and I spoke with Director Fitchard yesterday, there was a slight confusion around reference to a committee that had Member Hayes, Member Campbell Gooch, and myself. Did that get corrected? Are we voting on a corrected copy? All right. Thank you. Any more focused discussion? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And now we can move on to Director Fitchard for the Executive Director's Report. Um, quick, because of the time, um, so I'm going to just highlight some of the things that I think are most important. Um, and we've had a meeting, it's been, what, three weeks um, since our last meeting. Um, so one of the things I'll, uh, I'll I, we've had, I just want to tell you and remind you that um, we will, as a, as a staff, be going to Tucson, Arizona for the NACO conference. Um, that's going to be December the 12th through the 16th, and that's in person. Um, and board member Witzel will also be attending that. Um, I've attended several trainings um, in November, the Council on Criminal Justice Reducing Community Gun Violence, Why Collaboration Works, um, the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School, Policing Data, What Is It, What Can We Do With It, and Why Is It So Hard to Get, um, and then our whole staff attended, or those who were available, the NACO webinar, Investigating and Analyzing Use of Force. Um, we've, I've attended, and I need to make a, a change on your um, ED report um, on community outreach on Tuesday, November the 2nd, which I um, forgot to add that to it. I attended MMPD's Interpersonal Crimes Branch monthly meeting hosted by Captain Hunsucker, and he's invited me to share information about the COB in next month's meeting. Um, Tuesday the 9th, um, myself and Dr. Valier, we met with Ms. Um, Joy Carruthers Johnson, of J Training Solutions, um, and she spoke with us in length about her diversity, inclusion, and equity services, um, and she's also been working with the Human Relations Commission um, with the police department to share that information um, with them as well. 
Um, on Monday, November the 15th, myself and Dr. Valier gave a presentation to MMPD's lateral class, session 94, about the history of the COB investigations, mediation and research. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised that they were asking us questions um, and trying to find out more information um, about the COB. And so that went really well. It was a very engaging um, presentation. Um, uh, we've had three new complaints since it's uh, our last board meeting in um, October, um, and we've had three non-complaint calls for service. Um, just to give you an overview um, of where we are with complaints, we've had thir in, in thir we had 37 complaints in 2020, and we are currently, as of November the 12th, we've had 58 complaints. And so it looks like we continue to move forward as more people know about our services, they utilize our services. Um, the COB Budget Committee, I'd like to schedule a meeting with you all in January of 2022, and I talked to Dr. Hildreth about that, so that we can talk about the funding needs because we are moving into budget season, um, and they have, uh, the, the Budget Committee, Finance Committee has um, already reached out and said that we need to start those talks, and so they gave me a date of December the 6th. Um, to start those talks with them. And um, we want to be able to have a, a real um, conver a, a conversation that really addresses the needs of our board. So I am going to get with Ms. Hildreth, since, or Dr. Hildreth, since she is the chairperson of that budget committee, or whoever, <laughs> but we need to talk about that so that we can be prepared for those talks um, on December the 6th. We also um, have a nomination committee, and I spoke with, um, Chairperson Martinez, and I think that we have to have a meeting in December because, of course, in the in January it will be time for transition. And I don't know which um, those of you who are transitioning off, if you want to come back on, that's fine. But we do need to talk about that and schedule a meeting if we could the early part of December, um, so that we can talk about that and um, how that process will work for us. So I'll get with you all who's on that committee. And that committee is um, Mr. Wynn, Judge Brown, and Mr. Abdullah. So, and of course, Chair Martinez. Um, I did want to talk about the proposed resolution report response from Chief Drake. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time to get into it, and but we can if you want to, after we do the PR, talk about it, or I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, after we do the ED report. Um, but um, he sent that back with an updated recommendation of in exonerated, and I sent that out to all of you. Um, and if you have questions about that or want to address that, we can do that in, in a moment. Um, we've had no issues with receiving records. Um, I will attend a force review board hearing on Monday, December the 6th. Um, I also, um, myself and Dr. Valier attended the uh, first Partners in Care Committee meeting on November the 4th. And I also gave you that, um, we presented you with the data that we received from that particular um, from that meeting. And I just want to spend a little time talking about that. Um, I, I went to that meeting um, and, and I, I expressed to you as board members that I've um, had some concerns that we weren't um, included as stakeholders on that, on, that, on that particular committee. And when I think about a board um, or a committee that deals with mental health um, of, of people that the police are encountering that have mental health conditions. And the fact that, that we were excluded from that committee, it really bothered me. I brought that information up to Mr. Bunton because he is our advisor um, and expressed my concern about what I saw at that meeting, which was a board, I'm sorry, which is a committee of people, but there was not one person on there, a, a person of color. Um, and I think that after we have had multiple police shootings, several involving mental health, um, people who are experiencing mental health conditions, as well as someone who was shot and killed who was experiencing a mental health condition, and to exclude us from that um, was, number one, it was, it was a little alarming, to be honest with you. Um, and the fact that I have had to ask multiple times to be on this committee, I think it's just, um, 
it, it doesn't make sense to me. And so I wanted to make certain that I express that to you all, that when we are talking about our the residents of this city and those who have mental health conditions, you know, we are advocating for them and we have stood behind this whole co-response the entire time and supported it. And um, the fact that the community oversight board isn't there to to see what's happening, to hold the police accountable, I think is a, a, a just a huge error on their part. Um, I reached out to um, the, I think, um, Miss Brock um, and asked her once again, you know, could she follow up and let me know when, you know, this decision would be made that the community oversight board would be invited to participate and be a committee member. Um, and she said that they're having a meeting on November 30th and then that at that at that particular time they would um, determine whether or not they want to include us. I find that to be very problematic and I think that all of you should as well. And so, you know, the fact that they're having meetings, dealing with people who are experiencing mental health issues, they're making decisions on it, they have data on it, and we're not there as, as an accountability board um, is problematic. And so I just wanted to address that. If you all have anything to say about it, I would definitely like to hear it. Um, and as talking about the data, um, I got with Dr. Valier, and we went over this. I was surprised um, when I looked at this data. Um, one of the things that um, was of interest was me, and I brought it up at the meeting, was there was um, e event injuries. There were seven injuries. And, you know, so my concern, I asked about that, you know, were these injuries um, involving when a person was arrested, you know, were they, you know, having some type of um, encounter with the police at the time. Um, and, and, and that in itself is reason enough for us to be on this committee. It, it sh we should have been offered that invitation right when they were forming it. Um, as well as when I look at this data, I look at where they have 29.82% of unreported or refused race. We have no idea what the race of those people are. I don't understand why that is because usually on the race, on the incident reports, the race is, you know, put in by police officers. It's self, it's not self-reported. The officer is reporting that race. So when I look at that number, I think that that's a little concerning. It's almost 30% that we don't know what the race of the person is, but yet and still they have the gender completed. So I just think that there's some, some a lack of transparency in this data. Um, and so um, and, and the fact that we're not there to help support them and get the, good, the, the data out for the people. We don't know what's happening, you know, in comparison in other precincts that don't have the, the um, pilot. You know, this is only in two particular um, precincts. So how do they get these numbers if they haven't compared it to the calls for service in the other precincts? So there's just a lot of information here that um, I think that we would like more information. We think that it would be what we would call what transparency really looks like. Um, and so that's, all, that's really pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, yeah, that's it for the, that's it. We, I do have, a, I had a department head meeting last, uh, it was on Thursday, October the 28th, um, and we just went over the COVID stuff mostly. So I think that's the conclusion of my ED report. Mr. Campbell Gooch, Mr. Holloway, and uh, Mr. Whistle. Oh, thank you for the ED report. I, um, yeah, sorry about the difficulties and like, and I don't know why I'm apologizing, but it seems extremely stressful not to be able to do the oversight. Um, so I think in situations like this, I think what, as a board member, what would be extremely helpful is if we had like a legal memo or a brief on what legal actions we can be taking when it comes to situations where we're like left out um, and, it's, and it's not allowing the board to actually present oversight. So if I could request uh, from the attorney, if we can get like a legal brief or just like, just to hold the legal options that we have when it comes to issues like this, because I do think we've did quite a bit of talking at this point. So I think the next action when it comes to issues like this, where we literally can't do proactive oversight, which will probably happen when we get those LPRs, I think it's important that we have in front of us what legal options we had as far as like 
what can we be doing next to help remedy this this type of situation? And I'm mean, just to just to say something in regards to what um, Member Gooch just said. Like, if 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 we're not invited to participate in a stakeholders committee meeting regarding, you know, individuals of this city um, who are suffering mental health um, issues and in and, and their interactions with the police. I just don't see how they think that LPR auditing and us having oversight is going to even work. I mean, they're not being cooperative with the things that we should be invited to. I just can't see how they would be really open and transparent as it, in regards to auditing LPRs. Mr. Holloway. First of all, before you uh, do an illegal uh, thing, well, you, first you've got to expose them. You've got to do a press release. Let them know this is an all-white board, and they are not representing people that look like us, and we do need representation. So your first thing, you need to expose them to the press. And I will say that um, Ms. Johnson, the public defender, was the person that was um, included in that stakeholders meeting, but she delegated it to her, um, her, one of her, her deputies who is over mental health. She's, you know, she's not a person of color. And so that's why the board, when we went in there, there was not one person. And there was only one community group there, which was NOAA. Mr. Witzel and then Mr. Wynn. Uh, yeah, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Member Campbell Gooch was saying. I, I, I just wanted to just offer my support to that, us like figuring out what our um, legal options um, and I just want to throw out these questions. Uh, I don't know if anyone can answer them, but just to put them out there on record, like what was the reason given for us not being invited? Um, what criteria was used to come up with uh, this list of stakeholders and who came up with the list? Um, who, who made the, who sent out the invites and, and decided to leave the CLB off? So I just wanted to put that. Yeah, out I don't have that answer. I, I don't have that answer, but I will. I can look. At, I can ask about it. The only thing that um, when I brought this up to um, Director Bunton, he reached out to Angie, David, and Amanda, and you know, one is from the health department, the police department, and mental health co-op, and he said that I reached out to him about the possibility of the COB joining the stakeholders committee, and that's that was the end of that. Mr. Wynn. No, that, that was going to be my same question. Um, but I think, Director Fitcher, you've got right to be suspicious um, of any government operation that's got this kind of a controversy to it for them to say, we don't want oversight involved in it. I mean, I, it, it, it just, it, it, treating you like a plaintiff's attorney in a lawsuit. That's not what you are. You represent, and we represent the citizens of Nashville. So by them excluding you in such a critical position, it just it it just begs. What do you? What's your problem with that? What what is it you're afraid of? To have oversight. If you're proud of what you're about to do, and you want to tell the citizens of Nashville that we're spending your tax dollars to, for this program, why would you not? want the, 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 the seal of approval from an oversight board. It, does, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, other than they just don't believe in this board, or they don't understand what the board does. Um, so I think you have a right to be suspicious, and I think it, uh, they should reconsider. So that's my opinion on it. Mr. Goddard. Uh, yeah, my comments, um, I, I hear and understand and agree with everything you said. Uh, Executive Director Fitcher. My comments have to do with the report. I was shocked at how little data and how short the report was. And I, it, maybe I don't understand some of the data, can't read it well, I'll acknowledge that. But I couldn't begin to tell whether this was doing a good job, a bad job, or something in between. Um, and, and if you are allowed to participate in that committee, I would encourage you to do the following. And if you're not, figure out, if you can, how to get these questions to that board. 
what questions are they trying to answer? What are they monitoring? What recording of, of data and the instance uh, are they taking or requiring in the reports that would further that? Um, and specifically, whether there are any instances where having a marked car and a marked policeman show up and be the first person at the scene seems to have made matters better or seems to have made matters worse. That is still the piece that frustrates me the most about this, that there isn't some part of the pilot that does some one way and some the other way to try to answer that, to my mind, critically important question. Thank you. Mr. Hayes. I, I, I do understand about the legal action and all of that, but it just seems like to me it's just, it's just very basic. Uh, this administration has to decide whether they're going to work with this board or not. Uh, because we, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this board's been in operation for at least three years. And it's, it's, it's continually a struggle, even though it's been overwhelmingly voted for by the citizens. And I do think the citizens at least have confidence that this board, whatever the problem is, they're going to try to get to the bottom of it. They're going to ask the right questions. And I think that's where that confidence comes. But I know there have been a number of organizations where they want people to tell them what they want to hear. But we're trying to get to the root of the problem. But to me, it's not really lawsuits. Is this administration going to work, going to ensure that who, at whatever department it is, that they're going to work with this board. The citizens, this is what the citizens of Nashville wanted. And right now, it's not happening. And it's very disappointing. But again, not surprising. Mr. Holloway, did you have a? Well, it's not a secret. It was done by design. It was a purpose for it to be set up that way. It wasn't no intention. They have no one of color on there. And we got to stand our ground. And uh, we got to let them know there's power in the vote. And we got to let, starting with the mayor all the way down. You got a lot of election coming up next year. And we're going to stand our ground, and we're going to beat the bushel with the people and get the votes out there, and we're going to do what needs to be done. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say and frame why I went to the place of uh, wanting a, a legal memo um, and start having like legal options when it comes to these things. It's a pattern, which I think the pattern of behavior already gives us our answer when it comes to oversight. And I think it was Pastor Davey Tucker who came in here mul on multiple occasions and mentioned that at best we've had cooperation from day one with a department that does not want proper oversight. Even it beckons to say retroactive oversight where we can actually root out bad policies before they actually go into effect and harm someone. So with that being said, I think the intention of the administration is in the lack of actual cooperation and oversight that we've been able to implement. It is still, I think, quite unusual for two bodies of government to have to sign an MOU dictating how they work together when they are actually two branches of the same organization. So I just wanted to mention and hold that because I think to submit this into a place where we don't have to continuously re hash the same conversation over and over. I do think it will take a bit of legal actions from our um, attorney and from whatever we need to do to make sure that this is cemented in a way that outlasts all of the board members and the current staff and goes well into the future. But if this board, which is at its infancy, and the department that we are tasked to oversee through the charter, isn't propped up in a way that it's longevity, I feel and I'm fearful that our actions have been for nothing. Um, and that is also me thinking about the groundwork and the immense mobilization that it actually took to bring this into fruition. So I wanted to hold that there and also mention again that when we do have these issues, I think it'll help guide the board to action if they do come with a set of legal strategies so that we know this is what we need to do to get this done. Mr. Yoon.
Are there any more uh, questions for Director Fitchard? If not, we can move on to the proposed resolution report. All right, I'm presenting to you PRR uh, CC 2020-014. It is a citizen-initiated complaint received by the MNCO on April 28, 2020, on behalf of two complainants who alleged that five MNPD officers entered their home where they and three minor children reside, cussed, used excessive force by way of slamming complainant one's head into concrete, and failed to administer first aid afterward. Based on the complaint, the MNC investigated 21 potential allegations of misconduct, particularly without body camera footage of the encounter, unfortunately, the MNCO was not able to make a finding by a preponderance of evidence reviewed about whether these allegations were sustained or unfounded. We did look at photographs of both the officer and the complainant, one taken shortly after the incident to corroborate their versions of the events. And apart from that, we had to rely mostly on the interviews and the words of the persons involved. Ultimately, we did not sustain 20 of the allegations of misconduct, and we did not sustain any misconduct against four of the five officers. I did sustain a violation of misconduct against Officer 5, finding that Officer 5 did not adhere to policy regarding stop and frisk of individuals. Generally, police may stop a person when that officer has specific and articulable facts that rise to the level of reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. It cannot be a hunch, and it does not have to rise to the level of the more demanding standard required for arrest, which is probable cause. During his interview, Officer 5 admitted, and the other four officers corroborated, that he was the officer who initiated the encounter with complainant one. The five officers claimed that they inferred consent to enter the home from complainant two when complainant two walked backwards from her doorway after the officers knocked on it. The officers were in the general vicinity based on an unrelated matter um, and claimed they smelled marijuana em emanating. Should we work on that? While Officer 1 spoke to Complainant 2, Officer 5 initiates the encounter with Complainant 1. Complainant 1 was seated in a chair near the door when the police enter. Officer 5 verbally asks or tells the complainant, can I pat you down for weapons? I just need to make sure you do not have any weapons on you, and then you can sit back down. Complainant 1 responds in the negative, saying, no, don't touch me. Complainant one also stands up, and according to the officers, he sounds agitated. 
Four of the five officers then attempt to restrain the complainant physically, which results in officer two getting bitten on the arm and complainant one receiving multiple strikes to the body and getting charged with the felony aggravated assault, which is ultimately dismissed. Uh, and I will say that complainant also had a knot on his head and we were able to observe that through the mugshot photos. Um, during the interview of Officer 5, Officer 5 states, it is common practice anytime I come into contact with somebody, especially if we are doing an investigation, I always, for detective safety purposes, do a pat down for weapons. And per policy and law, however, pat downs for weapons must be justified by specific and articulable facts. In other words, evidence that gives rise to reasonable suspicion that complainant one was in fact armed and dangerous and not just sitting in his house on a chair. Um, it is not constitutionally permissible to pat everyone down in, in every encounter. And Officer 5 did not provide any basis to believe that complainant one was armed and dangerous or committing any violation of the law for that matter um, prior to attempting to pat down. And I also note that Officer 5, it, that had Officer 5 had Officer 5 been intentional in the misuse of force, it would have violated MMPD policy on excessive use of force, which is a category A offense. And based on the findings, however, I found that Officer 5 was in violation of the manual 4.20.040A adherence to policies and rules, which is a category D offense by way of violating MMPD manual 2.20. Point zero three zero regarding the stop and frisk procedure. And after reviewing Officer 5's disciplinary file, I saw no other similar violations um, in the preceding three years. And so that my recommendation um, is that corrective action be um, for a um, category D offense. Uh, just one second. a two-day suspension and in-service and or roll call training regarding MMPD manual 2.20.030 regarding stop and frisk. And that concludes that. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Any questions from the board? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the proposed resolution report as is. Thank you, Judge Brown. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Uh, any focused discussion? Not all in favor of approving the PRR, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you, Director Pritchard. Thank you. Um, that's it. Next on our agenda is public comment. If there's anybody who signed up to speak today. You have three minutes. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm Erica Perry, I use any pronouns. I'm with the Black National Assembly. Um, I think it's important to name that we don't support any form of license plate readers. Um, we have held conversations with uh, specifically black community members for over a year now where we talked about public safety and we've done this through assemblies and through mass meetings and through uh, just conversations that we're, as we're canvassing. And we asked the question of what does public safety mean to you and look like? Um, and people mention housing, they mention, mention fully funded education, um, they mention access to health care and good paying jobs. So people never mention license plate readers. Um, and it's important to name that a lot of the people we are talking about are black people who are directly impacted by targeted policing, uh, people who are impacted and have been incarcerated or often held in uh, jail because they can't afford uh, to get out, and people who have experienced violence themselves, and this is all types of violence, whether we talk about sexual violence, robbery, theft, these are people who are actually directly impacted when we talk about public safety. And I just wanna name again, they never mention 
or we never mention license plate readers. Um, we oftentimes don't mention police or jails. And so we do often talk about alternatives uh, to these institutions, and we talk about community-based solutions. Um, and I've been to the, these meetings a few times, and I never hear that brought up, and I want to name that that's important. And I hope that um, as we finish our survey right now, we're in the process of surveying community members um, and uh, hosting listening sessions uh, to surface what public safety really means in developing a public safety plan. And I hope that we can give a report and maybe you can discuss that and think about alternatives to these institutions. I think you know that policing has failed us. Y'all know that we've spent, I mean, you know this, we spent uh, billions of dollars in policing in this city and this country and our, our streets are, um, we remain in conflict with the police and we continue to have safety issues. I think it's also important to name, uh, I know I got like probably 10, uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, one minute. That I haven't heard a discussion about a racial imp the racial imp uh, a racial impact statement as it concerns license plate readers. And so we know that black people are disproportionately impacted by policing. We make up what I think 50% of arrests in the city, uh, while we make up maybe less than 30% of the population. And again, probably like I think 59% of the people held in pre-trial detention are held in jails. And so it's important to consider that when we think about the role of license plate readers and the impact that have on black communities and likely, as I said, I think a few weeks ago, increase our enforced encounters with uh, the police department, when it has, which has historically been violent uh, to our communities. And so my hope is that you'll take the position to ban license plate readers um, and not choose uh, either of the two bills. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello. All right, three minutes. Oh, yeah, great, thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak. My name is uh, DJ Hudson. I uh, currently work as a digital organizer for an organization called Media Justice, but I've also been a community organizer here in Nashville for about 14 years now. Um, I actually joined Media Justice, which is an organization that is a national group dedicated to uh, trying to do what we can to build as much justice as possible at the intersections of race, uh, gender, and economics, but also of technology and media. And my experiences organizing locally here in Nashville are actually directly what drove me to the work that I'm doing now at Media Justice, which I feel like is really relevant for this conversation you all have been having, uh, because I have learned firsthand that there are communities nationwide that are having the same conversation and these same issues. And what gets left out of these conversations when we're talking about data, when we're talking about police oversight and accountability is the fact, there, is the fact that these are tech companies. Uh, I believe that uh, Dave from EFF mentioned that, but I really want to underscore the fact that there are companies and corporations with uh, just absolutely mind-boggling amounts of wealth who are looking to monetize as many different markets as they possibly can. And uh, now the, the history and tradition of policing we have in the United States, but also the pandemic has seen an incredible spike in the growth of these companies. When I first started in media justice in 2019, I was focused on uh, mapping uh, Amazon's Ring cameras. Uh, Amazon had recently required Ring in 2019 in October, the number of police partnerships that Ring had went out and sought and acquired to have a direct partnership with local police departments. That number was 500 in October 2019. Uh, by the time we got to a year later, it had uh, already surpassed tripled. Uh, it was uh, 1,500 during the uprisings. In June of 2020, it got up to 1,600 by November about a year ago. It's uh, about 1,800 right now. That is just Amazon's ring. Uh, as, uh, as I believe that uh, EFF pointed out, that Flock is uh, trying to, to build a profit, is trying to build a market. They have found that in the economic upheaval and the trauma and the grief and the stress and the complete disruption of all of our lives that the pandemic brought, they found a rise in fear and in narratives that are seeking to prove that black people are meant to be feared, that our, our communities need to be policed, that we are not to be trusted, even when all we're doing is marching and saying that we can't breathe and we don't want to be killed by the police anymore. Another great motivator and driver for the work that I do is the, the families of Jacquees Clemens um, and Dan Dan Hambrick, who I've gotten to know over the work that I've been doing. 
even though these ideas of these technologies seems big and mystic, and it seems like if these tech companies, if Mark Zuckerberg, if Jeff Bezos just tell us that we can trust their tools, that they will solve all of our problems. But I'm thinking about the fact that both of these young men were killed during traffic stops. Any technology that increases the exposure of black people to policing increases the likelihood that somebody's, somebody's son, somebody's child, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle is not going to come home. But I also, as you consider this, want you to think forward as much as you can to the rise of surveillance capitalism. The fact that there are companies that are selling their products using the fact that people are concerned about public safety as an opportunity to come and say, hey, we have this tool that we can promise you is neutral. Please trust us and please use it. Thank you. I have Richard. one question for Captain Lara. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and it's a question that, you know, I'm going to pose to you. Um, and it is about LPRs. And so with the uptick of the move towards uses of technology, has MMPD thought about or are they moving towards creating specific discipline regulations that address the mismanagement or the misuse of technology as an added layer of protection? Have you all had that discussion? Thank you. First, it was good, good to be here. Thank you. Um, the department hasn't had any discussions on anything. We're, we're not implementing NPRs right now, um, so there's no reason to speak about any type of policies because we are not implementing them at this time. Have you done that with body-worn cameras? Have uh, you, are you just using... Ha so my question is, with the technology, you have body-worn cameras. Mm -hmm. And so if there's violations or mismanagement or misuse, have you all thought about implementing specific guidelines and regulations regarded to discipline for that particular technology? At this time, I don't believe we have any specific, uh, that I know of personally, any specific policies regarding the misuse of, of uh, the body-worn cameras. Again, that may be something that I uh, is it's still in the works, but I can tell you that we have other policies that do govern it. Um, so uh, adding more policies, I don't know if that's going to, uh, we, we already have policies that will govern and help us to uh, make sure that officers are not um, misusing any of the technology, not just body-worn cameras, but also our NCIC systems and computer systems, anywhere we can access um, anybody's information. Uh, so we've got policies covering pretty much everything, but if there's anything that the the department feels needs to be addressed that hasn't been, uh, I'm sure our, our uh, executive staff will go back in there and, and see if they can uh, adjust our policies uh, to, to make sure that we address those issues. Yes, ma'am. Any new business or announcements? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Oh, Mr. Valier. Um, I wanted to just make an announcement that the Metropolitan Council We'll be having a joint meeting um, between the Public Safety and the Transportation Committees uh, on uh, the 8th of December at 5 p.m., which is focused on license plate readers. And so they'll be having a special committee meeting. So for folks who have been watching um, or who are interested, that is the next opportunity uh, to have to for this discussion. As well as December 20th, um, the, at the next board meeting, the next community oversight board meeting, we also are planning on having at least one guest to discuss license plate reader oversight uh, from Oakland, the chair of the um, over, uh, surveillance oversight board, who will discuss their um, experience conducting oversight over license plate reader systems. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Judge Brown. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Witzel. All in favor, say aye. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.